one where we're doing the um, uh, how we're handling the aggregations. My computer. Because sometimes, yeah, I know we're talking about it. It makes sense. But if we ever, if anybody ever wants to go back and watch this, I want them to be able to see the code. Oh, see right here. This is kind of the secret sauce right here, everyone. Uh, this is what will help you with really any type of aggregation you want to do. Or, uh, and I think um, for those who are familiar with Spotfire or came from there, um, they have, it's a little bit more intuitive where you can right click on the field or even a Tableau and just do it from the drop down. But here you can essentially create that same uh, ability. But it's all, again, from a governance standpoint and going back and defining it, it's very, it's very. So. so you have, this is really neat. So in that first, if we kind of walk through it a little bit line by line, sure. you have in like line four, there's a reference to that measure called selected measure. And that basically will just return to you. Um, I assume, I guess it returns to you a reference to the selected measure of those eight that, that are selected, right? It'll return to you like the measure itself and not the value of the measure calculation. The selected measure. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, so the neat thing about this selected measure is that the one that I showed before is that you can use that in other measures. So I'm using the same thing, but what I'm doing here is actually calculating last year. So we have to do all those things because of express data, um, because it's a weekly one. So that's why we have to do that, all those steps. So you can bring back and it will be the same select measure, but it will be the values for last year. And we'll return the values here. So do you understand, do you want to walk through Brent, the, the measures and how that's aggregated on an individual level? Because she has that underscore key measures and that's essentially what you're looking at mm -hmm. in the chart below. Yeah. So it's saying, hey, look at, I see, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at the key measures table for ag the aggregation column where it equals sum. And you see how we have all the sums and then we go into the averages and D count is distinct count. We just kind of made that up uh, and it, it, yeah. That's just what, you know, kind of just inside business logic there. And basically, uh, yeah, we were able, and, and the cool thing about this is too, is you can also bring back, and you, you can see she also has like the sum X for some, so it's very intuitive. I mean, it knows what it's looking at, but it allows you to maintain all of those measures across the top and it doesn't just sum everything or <laughs> to the max of everything. We found that out really fast because we were getting some very extraordinary numbers for ones that needed to be distinctly counted as opposed to just doing the sum. And uh, yeah, that was. Yeah, this this is, I really like this. This is really great um, because you can do that, that kind of changing of the measures and then doing the average X and sum X. So calculating by row and then aggregating. This is really great. Yeah. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, while we're here, there are, I, you know, we always have a range of people on the call. And so, you know, this is a little more on the te on the technical side, which is really good because we've talked about, you know, business process and high level strategy, too. So um, I, 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 people who are kind of new to DAX, they might be interested to learn, like, why some X? What is the what is the difference of that wow. between like some X and just a sum? On I'll let, I'll let you take that one. Uh, some X is done a role level. So, um, Zoe, can you help me out here? How to best uh, explain the difference? Right, so it's right, like a roll like, I'm <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah, I thought that, that one's a curveball, and I, 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 I uh, uh, really, really <laughs> kind of cool. So a lot of times, um, so the way to do it without the average x or sum x basically is say you had your your calendar row tables, and then now you've created an average for each row. So for each, each row, you're doing that average. And then what it's going to do is average all those averages back up. So instead of calculating all the values at the bottom and then doing the division or the averaging, it'll do it by row mm -hmm. first and then recalculate it on the whole thing. 
but basically, so if you have it by region, so you have by region, you have, you know, 20%, 20%, 50%, 30%, but it's a way to kind of then, but if you added those numbers up, it would come up with a different percentage. So it's a different way of looking at those, those pieces in there. Um, you can also do like medians. So a lot of times I'll run into this, like, do you want to see the average, the whole up average? So, you know, the total sum divided by the total count, or do you want to see it by row and then average the averages, or do you want to see like a median of that value? So it's really interesting way Pat, the DAX can handle it. And it does take a minute, like when you first do it. Um, so the easiest way to do it is if you created a calculated column in that table, did the average, and then you did another measure that averaged that calculated column. It's the exact same thing that average X does. Okay, nice. So, I see that the first argument that you oh, pass it. Oh, go ahead, Tony. I was gonna say, it sounds like, Zoe, you're saying instead of having one column and then a second column that averages that column to get that single value, is that? Yeah, it'll kind of do it all in one step. So it'll calculate it by row first, and That's then right. and then um, then figure out, is it, then redo it with those values. So the first argument you passed it, I see, is, uh, is, the, are, is the function values of this particular column. And so in a way, that sort of creates a table. It does create a table. They, in DAX, they would say that's a table function, right? So it's going to go row by row through those tables, it, through the rows of that table. And for every one of those values, it'll calculate the last year value, right? Um, it'll evaluate yeah. that whole LY statement. Yes. Yep. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. And, and it's, I think, I think one of the hard, really hard things. So as, as people like Tony, you were mentioning Excel users, Excel is so cool in that I can walk through every row and every column. I can go see every cell, right? I can like, I can go and I can touch that cell. Oh, I'm in, you know, given the spreadsheets I've seen, I'm in row CZ89974, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like I found it and I, and I could find like, this is where my formula went wrong or this is where it had an error, you know, but what, what, what makes tax really powerful, but also hard to understand is so much of that happens abstractly. So it, or it, invisibly, I guess, like it, it basically created a table when it ran values of this column and it, and it, it iterated over those things. It, you could have, you could have visualized that step by step in Excel, but, with DAX, they don't have a way yet for you to visualize it. I'm not sure, you know, given the size of some of the tables, that's not even possible sometimes. Yeah. Um, but that, yeah, it's, it's interesting how it, you have to, you know, it, getting people to make that shift um, to writing DAX formulas or just making it as absolutely as easy as possible. And the good thing about it is they'll, they'll be used to the pivot table experience in Excel, your, your users will. So, you know, maybe yeah. they can take advantage of that too. You're absolutely right. Uh, the, the best point you made there is kind of the abstract thought around this. And so we're hoping to, by what we've done here in the data model, <laughs> even make it more abstract. We're going to put it all in Synapse <laughs> and have the warehouse handle this. And anytime somebody needs a new measure, we'll just add it on the back end and they'll just populate it on the front end where they just drop the column in. So it's about to get a lot more interesting. Um, and what a non-technical person would like to say, it's magic. You know, it just happens. So uh, yeah, it, it's going to be really interesting to see what uh, when we push this out to some of our subject matter experts, what they come up with. And then um, taking the, that logic and applying it even further back to the pipeline. And I think Zoe mentioned it too. Sometimes having it within the model, as you load this thing up, it could help, it could hinder or delay kind of the visualization process. But like I talked about in the beginning, the further we put, push this back into the Microsoft Azure line, we'll be able to uh, handle a lot more of that processing there. It should be a lot more responsive within the visualization. So that's how, that's how we plan on kind of testing it out here, so to speak, in the, in the data model, and then moving it backwards and integrate within, um, within Synapse, within the warehouse. So. Um, I don't know how much more time we have left, but I was going, um, another thing that you alluded to was now that this is becoming so abstract and we're about to kind of strip away kind of the technicalities of all this 
And we also, uh, earlier, we're talking about uh, Tabular, but also DAX Studio. I didn't know if we had time, but I, uh, Anna and I were trying to, as we're developing this, try to create kind of, for the first time, a data dictionary of our DAX equations. And if I, any, yeah, I think we, Tony, I think we have pl plenty of time actually. So I, okay. and I, I should, I made a mistake actually earlier uh, in the scheduling and I, I had the time wrong basically. But anyway, oh. we, they, that gives us plenty of time. What's going to happen is Lane is going to come and present at a later meeting, probably, hopefully the August meeting. Uh, oh. but that gives, you, you kind of have a bonus uh, 15 to, to 30 minutes if you, if you need it, which I'm, and I think we, I, I know this group would benefit from seeing DAX Studio in action too. So please, let's, let's see that. Oh, yeah, let's, uh, let's take DAX Studio for a run here. Uh, you know, I'll just start at the basics too, right? Um, I'll go from, let me get this screen share here. Close, oh, go away, okay. So let's start real basic for, you know, because I don't know my entire audience here. But if you go to, and if you heard earlier this morning or maybe during lunch, you explored, but here's DAX Studio. Um, open source, you know, free to use to a certain extent. And you can read through here all the great little features and stuff. Um, you know, you go through the simple install process, you know, it downloads, it's pretty small. I already have it installed on my computer, but I'm just gonna at least just for those who are Want to visually see what that looks like? Oh, let me in there. Oh, this is my COVID nineteen. I guess I've got time to show that too. Uh oh. Okay, that's not done downloading yet. Get rid of this. I I have noticed when presenting. You know, it can it can definitely uh, be a yeah. little bit of a hog on your bandwidth. I'm trying to figure out what I don't need open, and I'm just closing it. <laughs> What's going on here? Hello. Well, how about this? Whenever you get it installed, you go through the processes uh, through the recommended setup. Deck Studio, here's the icon. Oh, there it goes. There's the first, there's the first step. And finally woke up. You go through the typical licensing agreement. I can only go to a certain, you can actually has an Excel add-in here as part of the full install or you can, you know, customize it, whatever. I just did the full install, you know, create a desktop app, whatever, install. And basically you get uh, to the point where I am here. Now, be sure that when you open this up for the first time, whatever Power BI model you happen to have, make sure it's already open. Or if you have a tabular server. Anyways, uh, with, with this case, I just have my uh, COVID-19 deal open here, I can, can connect. And I'm going to be bouncing back and forth in my notes here because, uh, but basically the great thing about bringing in this model now is I can actually go and explore all of my uh, columns or even more specifically, you could query. So let me bring up Where's my stuff here? Here we go. So if you wanted to know, let me run this. You can actually run this and actually look at your model and see what you called the measure, what was the name that you used, how was it captured? Of course, in, in this case, uh, it even shows you to the expression. So you're kind of like, okay, well, that's really cool, Tony. And like I said, we're trying to, to develop a data catalog. And also when other users come to me with certain issues that they've created in their, uh, in their PIVX files, I can open this up and it'll help me kind of 
find out exactly what they did and see where their errors were or what they were referencing to make sure everything is aligning right. But the great thing about this is for any one of these, and let me just bring them all in. There it is. Actually, I guess I'll just keep this up. But if you want to retrieve all the measures you've ever created, this is the query you can use for all your tables. You can see your tables. If you want to see which ones you create, uh, columns you created. So again, you can create your own measures, but you also can create your own columns as well as just retrieve every single column from your data model. Um, DAX has got a really good library that kind of uh, showcases all that down here in the, uh, the DMV. And you can search this through all those different, um, I think you have any part of like schema and we'll find it within it. So again, you can- So I think in. those DMV are, uh, if I remember right, this is really, yeah, this is really cool because I haven't really used it for this, but it, uh, dynamic management views is what that stands for, uh, not Department of Motor Vehicles in ACL. <laughs> right. No, you don't have to stand in line very long to get the uh, answers you need from here. So, um, again, you can come in here. Um, look at the, can you also use the Rotopack Analyzer? The what? The So, SQL BI also has a tool um, that you can download that works well with DAX Studio. So, DAX Studio can export all of those data and about your model into, we have to kind of set it up in this, the options. And you can open the Vertipack Analyzer and it includes the table with all the, includes a lot of this data in Excel, basically. And okay. then you can kind of see, uh, what it's really good for is to see kind of tables that have like a lot of rows or, um, and it gives you that measure, that measure explanation with the description and the expression as well. So. Um, oh. You have to go into the options and, and do it, but it's really cool. Um, so it'll put this all the stuff in an Excel, and then you can actually take snapshots as you're building your model and save them and then toss them in and out so you can kind of see what changes you made and how it impacted. Hey, Anna, I hope you were listening to that. I to do that too. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. actually, really, anybody that's working in Power BI, I highly recommend hearing, uh, listening very closely or if Zoe wants to repeat that, that's very- oh, Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm aware of that, thank you. you. You can get lost in your DAX expression very quickly with the more complicated uh, models that you build out. And so where I was going at, and Zoe, you hit it right on the, on, on the nose. Essentially, you, you know, I was showing you the queries and then yes, uh, you can be given the ability to essentially output to an Excel file from, from DAX every, uh, or whatever it is that you were, you were after. And so um, this is just a really good way. See, and there's your expressions. And so all of a sudden you're starting to build out that, that data catalog or in the case of Chesapeake using, uh, what was it? Calibri or, what was the name? I just forgot. Off the top Cal of my head. Calibra, I think. Yeah. yeah, Calibra. So I don't know how this can be used um, as integrated into that. I, I haven't talked with them, but that was the that definitely perked my interest in going, man, talk about building out a library very quickly and then being able to sit down with your technical team and your subject matter experts, or as he said, your data family to ensure that are these really what or in another way, is this the best optimized query to run this type of a measure or expression? So um, to, to do that in here, you output to a file, you run it again, and basically it tells you, hey, where do you want to drop it? You have these four options. So find out which one ever works best for you. We used custom export, and that's where we uh, brought out our stuff. So. Um, very powerful, but Zoe, good to know. Uh, that was very nice to know. So if anybody had any questions on that, again, I'm sharing full screen, so I can't, I can't see my, how are we doing on the chat? Was there anything from there? Brent? Uh, not, not right now. I did, I had some positive feedback, just that uh, the report looked really good. And um, I, I went ahead and put in the chat the links for DAX Studio and Vertipack Analyzer. Uh, anybody who's kind of new to the um, 
Power BI space, def, that, that sqlbi.com site is worth checking out. Those, those guys have been working with the underlying technologies of, of Microsoft's VertiPak and analysis services for a long time. They're very well, they've written books on it. They're, they're well-respected. Uh, experts as well to good and and do a lot of do a lot of free resources they definitely sell training they sell consulting that's very expensive um, but they also give away a lot of tools and contribute a lot to the community so they're they're definitely good to follow that's great to know yeah I actually um, I actually went to one of their training um, when I was first getting started into you know I'd gone from Excel to Power Pivot and working with DAX and I found that, especially coming from Excel, there's a lot of bad habits you can form learning by yourself with DAX. Um, you tend to make a lot of calculated columns versus measures just because you can see them and they're very comparable to coming from an Excel world. You know, right. just, that one's yeah. yeah, so what, but it's really cool. And what you can't see in Power BI, but you could see in Power Pivot is as soon as you start making those calculated columns, your Excel file got massive and slow. And you're like, well, what happened? And that's the difference between those calculated columns versus measures. Uh, measures are very, very performant, whereas the calculated columns are not. Um, and anyway, so I went to his training on analysis services, which is basically the same, the same data model engine. And it was really, really great. I learned a lot. Um, but yeah, they definitely know this stuff. I found all their materials to be to excellent in, in, in like ramping up with, with DAX and, and doing these data models. What you know, Tony? That just before you show us this, that that made me think when you were talking about your Excel users. I think that there may be something to consider, and it really relates back to what Scotty was talking about earlier. That since they have that comfort level with Excel, now you're showing them this new world right. that it's very powerful, but it doesn't have the same buttons and knobs. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like a Tesla, and it just has like a go button. Or you know what I mean? It's like um, myself how right? You, you yeah, go it's a cell phone buttons, exactly, right? To yeah. touch screen, and to it's a like, screen with no buttons. Oh, yeah, phone with no buttons, right? So then it's like, yeah, it is. So how the, I think that may be one question to ask as you deliver content to them is how will they learn to trust it, right? How will they learn to to know that all those rows and columns that you used to have to use are still there. It's just <laughs> being done automatically for you. Based on my experience, not just from trusting the software, Power BI, but also the data behind it. Um, I say at the very beginning, don't trust it because you guys have never had eyes on this stuff before in, in the way that you have it presented to you with so much information at your fingertips. So, I almost take this as an initial exercise into a data quality initiative that coincides with applying business intelligence. There's no reason why you still can't make business decisions off of this, but know that there's obviously some carried risk or understanding that not all the data is clean. But at least take the opportunity as you're looking for things to also use this as a data quality tool. And um, heck, even maybe start to find out certain visualizations you can create that could highlight those those outliers, and that will only help down the road um, develop new ways uh, from data gathering requirements, um, understanding the definitions of something as simple as how do you calculate um, like a return on investment type of ratio, what goes into that, and um, anyways. I, I never really look at anything as a mistake, but just more of an opportunity to improve. So that's just, uh, that's my kind of two cents on from, from that perspective. But yeah, good, good to know about, I, I, I'm at, I was looking forward to doing a lot of training this year, but uh, who knows? It sounds like a lot of it's gonna be done remotely or virtually, which is, which is okay. Sometimes it's nice to see all of you guys and just sit down at your computer and see you kind of work through it and kind of ask questions as you go. So it's not as formal, but um, yeah, I, uh, I look forward to things opening back up and kind of leads us into this wonderful discussion. I, uh, this keeps opening up. Um, so yeah, I think Rick, you, you had posted something on, or I guess, was, was there any other kind of insights anybody else wants to provide or just kind of good Power BI resources. And I know a lot of that's out on um, Brett, the uh, kind of our community site, which I've, I've kind of 
scraped that as best as I could. There's, there's a lot of good information out there in past presentations. No, I think, I think we can, I think when you move on to this, it'll be uh, interesting to see what you built here. Yeah. So as with any business, um, everybody, I, I started thinking about how at the time it was called COVID-19 was going to affect express. And so, um, I just, for even just, heck, even my own personal use, I wanted to know from, from, a just a data enthusiast who is collecting this data, how are they collecting it, what goes into collecting it. And through that journey, found about six different resources that were not citing each other. Because <laughs> that was the other thing too. A lot of people were reporting on it, but it was all coming from like, say, John Hopkins. And so figuring out why there were pros and cons to each of these data resources, um, I settled on, there is a, uh, uh, I believe, uh, the website still exists because I'm still pulling data from it, but it's called covidtracking.com. And it's actually a aggregation of health department resources that report at typically the same intervals every day. So you kind of get a nice, true kind of timeline for a specific state's health department and how they come up with their numbers. There's definitions behind it. Um, the website says, hey, what one state calls positive, it actually, another state actually includes those tested and waiting plus those who are positive. So it was interesting to kind of um, relate back to that, to kind of find the nuances in the data here. So, but my first stab at this was just your pretty typical, hey, how are all the states handling this? At the time I started this, it was just Washington and New York. I think maybe one case in California. So it was really interesting as it ballooned in New York, what it was doing to the numbers and. At the same time, too, it was exploring the new uh, shape uh, map preview that was released, or at least it was released to me, at least, when, when I downloaded it, but that was back in January. And so I was just trying to test it out through here with the maps. And so, you know, just obviously, it's, it, there's not a lot of, like, complexity in this. It was just a pure, from a spatial perspective, how is this, how are these cases rapidly developing? And I kind of settled on the mortality rate to see how states were handling certain cases. You know, New York has a lot of test positive and then, you know, trying to figure out what exactly that average is going to be for, uh, you know, the more, more the mortality rate in general. So I have it organized here by highest to lowest in terms of mortality rates. And of course, you know, everything's interactive with each other. So that was just kind of my first exploration of the data. I always like to create visuals that are very easy to explore the data to get my initial understanding of it. And once doing so, started to just apply some like logic to it. So what, I, what, what you're seeing here is on a log scale, the ability to say, hey, looking at all the states on a certain, you know, days after the 10th case was reported. And at the time, I think it was only on day 12 overall. So this chart has just really changed um, since I last opened it up about a month ago. But uh, basically what this is saying is these, all these states are above the average for the entire United States for their time after their 10th case was reported. So what this saying is, basically the best way to read this graph is for all the states where you see these increases, they're actually growing faster and they're tested, remember this is just tested positive cases compared to the average. So all of these states are above average. And obviously you can still see there, there's some weird stuff going on here at the end and that's only because of, you know, there's only, I think there's only maybe two states that are way out here that are, they're just a lot further ahead of other states who, who have gotten it. But um, basically this was just an interesting exercise because from there I got to determine what my top five states and that were below the average and those that were above the average. And so I was using this not only for my own personal just curiosity, but also, like I said, Express has offices located all around the US. We wanted to see how different states were going to react to this outbreak and also be prepared for it and uh, communicate to them that, hey, we're seeing some 
you know, you guys are on the same growth trajectory as New York. Uh, start taking precautions now, even though your health department hasn't said so. So we could have all of our offices coordinated together in terms of their response and how we handled hiring new people or shifting people around due to the, uh, you know, the massive unemployment numbers that we ended up getting. So let me minimize that. Um, and then obviously over here, you can see a lot of, and of course these states as they're increasing here means that they're beating the average by that much on that day. And the ones that are obviously staying flat are a lot closer. Again, log scale for a lot of this. So I know we're all in Oklahoma. Just for the sake of curiosity there, you know, we're pretty much in line with a, a whole multitude of other states. And so you can go in there and compare and do more analysis on that. But um, again, same type of chart, except I put everybody on the same chart. So obviously in here, the idea is there's some average in here and that just tells you, hey, all these above, all these below. And again, uh, we were talking about the trajectory. And so there's Oklahoma. It, it's definitely not growing as fast, but it's still increasing uh, daily in terms of positive cases. But uh, the more and more I realized more about the data, and you can see what states have, <laughs> you know, Washington, again, one of the first reported, followed by Michigan, you know, California. And yeah, so it's, it's, just, just kind of, an, and this was before, I know people have probably seen this in a lot of publications, but I had published this, uh, I had this all basically put together by the, uh, the middle of February. And it was just kind of interesting to see everybody else kind of catch on to those same things and kind of, if anything, cement kind of my initial thoughts and understanding and oversight of the data. But I think Brenda mentioned to you, and Zoe was talking about it too, but um, I'm familiar with a lot of our programming and doing a lot of forecasts there. So this is just one type of forecasting model, but basically you can come in here and I've got these four different models here that if I were to select a certain, well, I guess we'll wait, wait for it to, still processing here, so give it a minute. You can see I just updated the data to yesterday, so. And it looks like they are, um, there's some health departments that have done some backdating in regards to the reporting. So I thought that was really interesting. Hmm. Are, um, those, are, are those our visuals that you're loading? Yes. Oh, they run off my R library on my computer, if that's what you're referring to. So these are some automated uh, ARIMA forecasts. Um, which means auto regressive integrated moving average. It just, um, th there's another options for like neural networks. Anyways, uh, like I said, I, I kind of take a, a light approach to data science. I don't really take it all in as like, this is the truth, but it really gives a good trajectory around, you know, where do positive, you know, positive cases. It looks like I need to do some tweaking on my numbers here because, you know, I kind of, I got to change the thresholds because these positive cases I've noticed a lot of states will wait about and just report on the week. And so you get this rush of positive tests as they process them that they could have, the tests could have all have occurred or happened or sampled over the course of two weeks, but not have been processed. They could have all processed on one day or been reported on one day. So this number is not as helpful. And I think more, more states, especially like our, our state is reporting um, based on a moving average. So I might need to do something there to help, you know, make that look nicer. But, um, you know, I'm tracking deaths, new cases per day. This is the entire U.S., by the way. And then also those who are hospitalized. And so you can come over here and, you know, I can predict on a certain state um, within a range or some confidence level of where we're headed. And yeah, when I was first doing these uh, forecasts back here in February, it was it, it was it was pretty pretty scary stuff for just positive cases. I mean, it was tracking at like two million um, cases by the uh, by the end of March. So 
obviously with everybody um, performing their lockdowns and shelter in place or safer at home, whatever the terminology was throughout March, it, it made a, it made a very big impact. But you can see right here, like I just selected Oklahoma. It does the auto forecast and within the model, it chooses the best model based upon the arena uh, uh, modeling parameters. And you guys can look up what ARIMA is on Wikipedia. And you can read through all Duke. Duke is a really good white paper on ARIMA model, how long it's been used for uh, forecasting revenues. So, um, or just uh, cer certain data types, but pretty much this has been a really good forecast. And I, I actually can export by copying the clipboard. I can, and the thing is I can uh, actually bring this back to Let's bring it back to March 15th. And so this way you can kind of do like a, um, an unsupervised type of a, a learning model to kind of create your, uh, you kind of have like a test data set for your, your algorithm here to see how it fits into what you already know is the present number by going back in time. And so anyways, you can kind of play I don't know if it's changing or not. I think, yeah, it's still spinning over here. So anyways, you can copy that out. You can compare how they all go. Oh, something broke. Well, that one didn't, it, or did it? Well, anyway, like I said, I just opened this up for the first time in the last month because um, with everything kind of opening back up, it hasn't been a um, huge focus for uh, our company. It's just been, been more of now we understand what it is. We're, we're somewhat familiar with it now. How do we handle it according to CDC guidelines? And how do we open up our HQ and also our other offices? And how do we handle new new hires and uh, and approach clients with the with the talent pool that's out there? So, so this is something that you got to actually use inside of Express, and they uh, yeah, yeah, they, it was they, just they absorbed uh, some of it. Right, um, because if you recall in February, nobody had any idea what this looked like on a, on a national level. They knew on a worldwide level what it was doing in other countries, but we were looking at it as, well, it's gonna get here. So once it does, how fast in, from a visual perspective can you reduce uh, some of these numbers that we're going to see? And so we were all at our office sent home the day after St. Patrick's Day. I'm not saying that this was a cause for it, but what they were seeing, and because we have such a face-to-face -face contact with such a large amount of people that we hire every year, which is close to, um, we hire around just over half a million people every year. So we have a lot of contact with uh, the, every economic piece of our economy. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's an interesting data set to look at. And, um, but this was, this was something that, yeah, the numbers were just kind of like, wow, this is going to get, we, you know, we need to get, we need to push forward more like, like electronic documents for uh, getting people hired on to how do you do, um, how do you develop training for um, virtual interviews? You know, kind of like how we're doing right now. How do you do that? How do you help train people with the necessary skill sets to maybe transition from, oh, I don't know, uh, a janitor at a school that just got closed down to maybe a forklift driver where yeah. someone like Walmart was hiring what, you know, 300,000, I mean, the Instacart, you know, all these businesses were like, we're going to hire hundreds of thousands of people and they need this skill set from... <laughs> That from stalkers to forklift drivers. And I mean, that's, that's, yeah, that's just a big part of what we do. We know what skills those people need. And so we can make those transitions and help those people get jobs because they just lost all the other ones that weren't, that were not deemed as essential. Well, so. this is really, what a great, what a great, um, like real world application. And we, you know, we, we talk about, well, data is important to business. Data is going to drive business. I mean, this really informed them. You know, Express is, like you said, it's in a unique position. It's really people focused. And, and so, you know, how this was going to really drive, um, drive some of the decisions they made. So this is really cool. I'm glad you got to show this to us. 
Yeah, it, it, was, it was very crude in its, you know, approach. But again, it was just me doing ad hoc stuff as I was getting questions and this data was changing rapidly every week. I just had to be, I couldn't do anything too fundamental, like uh, in, in terms of like focusing on a data model or, you know, this is a pretty dirty way of doing it, but it was the best way to kind of discover what the best source was because the sources were always changing. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to kind of keep up with the pace of things. And so also providing um, data in a way that they don't traditionally see it via a newspaper or whatever health department website they were looking on back in March. And of course now a lot of health departments have, and I think, gosh, I want to say the state of Oklahoma uses Looker now, I believe, mm -hmm. the Google product. Mm -hmm. So they've got, I mean, everybody has matured since February and since I've done all this. So it's kind of like, well, I guess I'll just go out there because they're going to have the data first before I do. And well, and well this is really, yeah, this is very, very neat. And uh, I just want to say thanks again for showing us this and, and the first dashboard that you guys put together. A lot of useful, um, reusable concepts uh, from, from this and, and from others. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was great to have, have you on and thank you for actually extending your time a little bit. That also helped us. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot, Tony. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's it off the top of my head. I mean, I have a whole nother thing that I've just, you know, it's kind of my playground or sandbox that I've made a lot of mistakes on and, um, just, you know, the typical frustrations we all grow through when we're trying to understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. IT perspective, a new data set and then um yeah I, i'm curious to know how whenever we get our that initial dashboard set up i know for a fact they'll want to start um they will want to start bringing third-party data so we we use a lot of sources in, in the in the just the staffing industry that are it's kind of even in oil and gas, you know, you've got IHS as a IHS market is a huge data provider. And so bringing those in and understanding how to consume those right now, our business has is limited to that company providing us the data on an as needed basis. And hopefully with power BI and the Azure, the Azure data pipeline, we can start to feed those APIs in that way and then begin to overlay our business data with, I mean, we use stuff like American Staffing Association, uh, the BLS, census, .gov, I mean, you name it. Um, we can follow and kind of then predict certain trends in the economy and where it's going. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty exciting space to be in right now. I know things are, are rough on a lot of different businesses around the, uh, the country, but in, in, in this space, like you said, the <laughs> Microsoft team's not slowing down. They are, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I've been blown away in the last six months what they've done. Um, because I was first introduced to Power BI in 2012. And I was like, man, this thing doesn't have a hope in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they've come a long, a long, yeah. long way. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think, so I think what we'll, what we'll do, um, it's about 2.45 and so, uh, at three o'clock, we're going to have our roundtable time. And so um, if you want to stick around for that, we'd love to have everybody stay. And I'm going to I'm going to open it up and open us up to Zoom bombing. I hope not, but I'll, I'll make it to where everybody can unmute themselves. and We can kind of collaborate and talk. If you have a special topic you want to talk about, that'll be a great time for it. And and, and thanks again, Tony. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and put a, a slide up. Yeah, thank you very much. We're going to put a slide up that kind of says um, we'll be back at three o'clock. And uh, that's when we'll be back to kind of do a roundtable discussion. Well, thanks for the time, Brent, and everybody else. Thank you. Time and listening in.